our program committee, you know, when we look at the annual conference, we try to kind of be a little bit more strategic, a little more high level, and, and one of the topics we always cover, because uh, it's near and dear to everybody's heart, is the economy. Um, and if you've been to BMI annual conferences past, you know that we traditionally had a more investment banker type speaker uh, give us their impressions of what was going to happen with the economy. And uh, the program committee made, a, I think, a, a really great decision in, in trying to pivot away from that maybe for a year and see how this goes and look at it from a more academic standpoint. Um, so I am happy to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Jaya Kumar from the University of Tampa. Uh, and he's going to give us a, a little presentation and economic outlook. Thank you very much. Thank you. So thank you very much for inviting me today. So I teach macro at the University of Tampa and also typically cover courses in like monetary economics, uh, emerging markets, uh, international finance. So those are the sort of areas I'm very much interested in. So today, uh, there are a bunch of really interesting things going on with both the U.S. economy and the global economy. And I wanted to give you guys a really nice overview of some of the things a lot of you are probably quite interested in. And also, if you think about one of the big concerns we have right now, so everybody is talking about inflation. In fact, it's supposed to be the main issue for tomorrow's midterm elections. But Inflation has been around with us for at least the last 12 months now, and we have already seen a lot of action from central banks to try and deal with inflation. But now we are getting to a stage where we are getting a little bit more concerned about what comes next. Are we headed for a recession in 2023 as the stock market already bottomed out? Are we finally going to see the labor market reach a peak and maybe start to see unemployment pick up. And then, this being Florida, a lot of people are worried about real estate and what's going to happen to property prices. So there's a bunch of things going on right now besides just the concerns about inflation. And in fact, as we'll see today in our discussion, as the Fed and other central banks start hiking rates, there is the potential that we are entering a period of increased uncertainty where we could sort of go off the rails if we are not careful. And what's interesting is pretty much everybody is worried about what comes next, but nobody is really sure about what comes next. So we are in a truly heightened period of uncertainty and so what I wanted to show you guys today is just a feel for how we got to where we are today and where we might be headed and what are some of the best guesses as to what the outcome might be in the next 12 to 18 months. Now again, keep in mind, as our uh, Fed Chair Jerome Powell recently admitted at a press conference, there are a lot of things they don't know and there are a lot of things most people don't know. So that's, in one sense, a little bit scary when your central banker comes out and says, well, we don't really know what's going to happen. Uh, we are sort of flying by the seat of our pants. But the problem is when they make a mistake, they can actually take the entire global economy into a recession. If you and I make a mistake and we screw up, probably it's not going to affect too many people. But even they screw up, it's not just going to affect especially since the Fed is sort of like the de facto world central bank. It can end up affecting the entire global economy. So that's why it's kind of interesting and helpful to get a broader sense of what's going on. And by the way, normally I tend to give these talks to folks from the financial industry and folks from the commercial real estate industry, but I'm really excited to talk to you guys because I think I'm one of your best customers. I am a bit of a bibliophile, so over the last 25 years or so, I think I've built up about a personal library collection of 3,000 to 3,200 books. <laughs> so. And I'm pretty old fashioned, so I still buy print books. So <laughs> there, there's nothing like the smell of a new book. 
It's one of the best things. Now, to begin with, let's get some of the bad news out of the way. So IMF is getting very gloomy. Uh, the Fed is starting to get worried. And there are a lot of things to be worried about. We have geopolitical uncertainty. We have uh, inflation at levels we have not seen since 1982. Uh, growth is starting to slow down. Rates are getting to levels a lot of us have not seen since at least 2006. So we are getting to a period where we have to start getting a little bit more concerned about not just a regular recession, but the risk of something breaking in the financial system and creating a much bigger shock to the US and global economy. Now, nobody is good at forecasting. In fact, there's a great joke. The only reason why we have economic forecasts is to make the weather forecasters look good. So uh, one of the things we have to think about is there's really, given how many shocks that can potentially hit the economy, both domestically and internationally, it's really hard to be too certain about these things. And in fact, you can kind of see how much projections have been changed even since the last few months. So the IMF does forecast in April, July, and October. Already the April and July forecast turned out to be wrong. So there's a good chance the October one will probably be wrong as well. But one thing to be uh, cognizant of is now they're giving you a pretty broad range of potential outcomes, and we cannot rule out some of the worst outcomes for next year, potentially even a global recession, which is quite rare. Now, it's not just about growth, even inflation, a lot of people have been quite wrong. So for a while last year, we kept getting hammered with the message that a lot of things are transitory and they will just go away on their own. Of course, that turned out to be a bad bet for the Fed and a lot of other central banks. And as you can see, they have had to ratchet up their forecast for where inflation will peak globally uh, up and up during the last several months. Now, there is still the possibility even this might not be uh, sufficiently hawkish and we may have to expect even higher rates depending on how severe the winter turns out and what sort of potential future energy shocks or some other shocks we might get. So those are some of the areas of concern. Now one very interesting dilemma we have, because of the pandemic, a lot of governments spent an extraordinary amount of their uh, sort of fiscal space trying to help prop up the economy, try to provide unemployment benefits, try to help people out in 2020, because pretty much nobody knew how to deal with lockdowns and a sudden shutdown of the economy. So there was an enormous amount of fiscal spending that took place. Of course, the downside of that is debt levels have exploded, public debt levels. So US government debt is at levels that we last saw in 1945 during World War II. So that means if you do get into a mess next year and get a recession, it's pretty unlikely they're gonna be sending you those checks anytime soon. Or expand, expanding unemployment benefits. Also keep in mind, after tomorrow's election, very high likely we would have a divided government. And I very much doubt the Republicans will wanna give Biden any kind of a win next year. So it's very unlikely we will get too much fiscal stimulus next year when we end up in some sort of a sharp slowdown. And the Fed can't do its usual thing of just flooding the economy with cheap money because inflation is continuing to be a challenge. So they will probably have to maintain rates at pretty high levels. So that's one thing to watch out for. If you do get the expected recession next year, don't bank on the government to save the day because they don't exactly have too much resources left to bail us out again. So that's one thing that might be different. Now, from an international perspective, before we get to the US, which is gonna be our main uh, focus today, just wanted to highlight a couple of things. So if you think the US has got problems, well, 
UK, Europe, and many other parts of the world are, are in much dire straits than us. The one thing that has helped us out is the fact that we have the world's reserve currency. So even if we screw up a lot, we get a much longer rope because we have the dollar. And we can create unlimited amounts of dollar, and the rest of the world still seems willing to accept dollars. So as the Fed has been raising rates, other parts of the world have had to deal with an additional shock. Their currency is weakening quite a bit. So the Japanese yen is down to levels we last saw in 1990. And uh, the pound was briefly around $1.04. And, and the euro is actually below parity. So it's like 97 cents, 98 cents for one euro. So they have bigger issues, and this is a problem for the rest of the world because a lot of commodities are priced in dollars. So oil globally is priced in dollars. So when their currency drops against the US dollar and they have to buy oil, it's even more expensive for them when they're buying it in pounds, euros, or the Turkish lira, or something else. Also, if some countries have borrowed in, issued dollar debt and borrowed in dollars, now you're going to have a difficult time repaying those loans or rolling them over because your currency has tanked against the dollar. Now, going forward, one of the interesting things to think about is after a very long period, for the first time we are seeing synchronized global tightening of monetary conditions. So since 2008, we all got used to this world of cheap money, low interest rates, central banks stepping in and propping up asset markets. But that era seems to be coming to an end as central banks race against each other to see who can tighten policy quicker. Now, pretty much all major banks have raised rates. The only old out, a notable one, is Japan, uh, because they had a very long period of deflation, so they have been pretty hesitant to raise rates. Now, that might turn out to be a pretty big mistake going forward. Now, if you look at most central banks around the world, they've all started raising rates. Some have even gotten out of negative rates and quickly moved into positive rates. So we have a pretty synchronized tightening of interest rates, money supply worldwide. So the availability of liquidity worldwide is tightening up. And this matters because we live in a world where capital flows freely across borders. Foreign, for example, when Switzerland had negative interest rates, a lot of investment actually came to the US. And in fact, Switzerland is one of the biggest holders of US stocks. Many of the people don't know this. But now that they have all started raising rates, credit is probably not going to be that cheap. And interestingly enough, given where we are with our rates compared to where inflation is, we still might have to keep going further. And that's something we will look at, especially with the Fed. But around the world, we might be in the middle to late innings, but we're not done yet with rate hikes. Europe has, England has a long way to go, because even today, inflation is much higher than interest, nominal interest rates. Uh, Europe still has a long way to go. If you look at countries like Switzerland, they finally got out of negative interest rates and moved into positive ter territory. Even smaller countries like Canada, Australia, they've all had to raise rates pretty quickly. The one old out, as I noted, is Japan, and it is taking a very, very big chance. Its currency has dropped precipitously. Uh, inflation has finally picked up in Japan. Now, whether this turns out to be something manageable or if the central bank is going to lose control, given that it's still keeping rates around minus 0.1%, when every, pretty much the rest of the world is raising it, is something we'll find out next year. Now, one interesting side note before we get to the US economy, some countries got ahead pretty early. Brazil is one of the few countries whose currency has actually done well against the dollar even though they had a pretty crazy uh, election season that just got resolved last week, they still, because they started raising rates last year, and today Brazil's rate is 13.75%, overnight rates. 
So as a result, Rial ended up actually doing pretty well, and that helped them out. But some countries like Turkey, which have not really done a great job hiking rates, have seen their currencies drop a lot. So one very interesting thing to keep in mind as rates keep going up, the markets, which have sort of gotten addicted to cheap money, low interest rates, and central banks bailing them out whenever asset prices fall, are desperately looking for a pivot. So every time somebody from the central banks gives a talk, they are looking for any clue as to when rate hike cycle will end so they can jump back into the stock market and other riskier assets. But they keep getting disappointed because we still haven't fully dealt with the inflation problem yet. So one of the really interesting things is how markets continue to stay extremely desperate for these rate hike cycles to come to an end. But central banks really don't have the room to start giving rate cuts or stop slowing the rate hikes anytime soon. So that's kind of where we are stuck. So one thing to keep in mind, many of you probably manage your IRA accounts or have personal trading accounts. We have seen several false dawns with this particular bear market. So in June, I think it was June 16th or so, when we got to around 3660 on the S&P 500, people thought, okay, that looks like a bottom, so a bunch of people jumped in, and we got a pretty quick recovery in July and August, and then again, we saw stocks drop. And the last few weeks, they've kind of picked up a little bit, but it's very hard to say that the bottom has been reached for this cycle, because one of the really important things to keep in mind, historically speaking, is the bottom of a stock market usually takes place somewhere around the beginning of the recession or the middle of the recession. And we still haven't gotten to the recession yet. And while rates have gone up, and that's affected various valuation models, what hasn't really happened yet is a dramatic write down of earnings. We still don't have a full earnings recession. So chances are the fourth quarter, or maybe the first quarter of next year, when companies report some big drops in their earnings or potentially losses, that's probably when we might finally get the bottom. So there are some folks who think we may go as far as 3,200 or even 3,000 for the S&P 500 before we get a new cycle, upward cycle for the stock market. So just be aware that there is maybe another leg to go in terms of the stock market correction. It may not be fully done yet. Now getting to the US, a couple of interesting things to point out right at the beginning. Early on, uh, say around summer of this year, a bunch of people were talking about whether we were already in a recession. One of the reasons for that is if you look at the first two quarters, we got negative GDP growth. And many of you, if you were sort of half awake during your principles of econ classes in college might vaguely remember this rule of thumb, two consecutive quarters of negative GDP growth might imply a recession. Well, that's not really true in America. In the United States, we actually have something called the National Bureau of Economic Research, which officially decides when a recession starts and when it ends. And they don't use this rule of thumb of two consecutive quarters of negative GDP growth being a recession. Instead, they look at a bunch of variables. That's why some of us writing this summer pointed out, no, we are not yet in a recession. We will get one next year, but we, are, we weren't in one in the first half of the year. Because when you think about it, the economy actually recovered pretty quickly from the pandemic shock. And as compared to say the Great Recession and the financial crisis where it took a long time to recover, this time, with the massive amount of stimulus, we got back pretty quickly. Also, when you think about other ways of looking at aggregate growth, if you look at year-over-year -year change, it doesn't look that terrible yet. Also, if you look at other measures like gross domestic income instead of gross domestic product, so both are very similar, but sometimes when you're looking at real-time data, gross domestic income might give you a better sense. 
and that hasn't actually shrunk yet. That's why some of us wrote this summer saying, hey, we are not yet in a recession. The labor market is still pretty strong. Consumers are still spending. Yes, pockets like inventories maybe got built up a little bit. Uh, certain sectors maybe were not doing so well, but overall the economy this year is actually going to muddle through. But next year, I think there's very, very high probability. I would say 80 to 90 percent probability we will get a recession. Now the timing is a little bit tricky. It might be closer to around May or so before we get clear signals. But some of the early indicators, financial indicators like the yield curve, have already inverted. So when the short end of the yield curve is above the long end, that's pretty much uh, almost a guarantee in the next 12 months you will get a recession because it's had very good track record predicting recession since 1945. And both yield curves just recently, the three month and 10 year inverted. And that's an even more accurate indicator than the two year and 10 year yield curve. So this essentially suggests that in about 12 months time, we'll probably have a recession based on past history. The one to watch out for in terms of what we're still waiting to get a clear signal on when the recession starts, you need to wait for unemployment rates to start picking up. So when it gets to that blue line, that's another indicator that's almost 100% accurate. So when we get a stretch where unemployment rate starts to pick up, and from the bottom it gets to about an extra 0.5%. So if you look at our current cycle, the 3.5% we reached for unemployment was probably the bottom. Since then we have moved up to 3.7%. If it gets to 4%, it'll hit that blue line. And then you'll get pretty much a pretty good con confirmation that we are probably at the start of the recession. Now, in terms of what are things that are holding things up this year, consumers have actually been extraordinarily resilient given all the crap they have had to deal with this year. High inflation, geopolitical shocks, gas prices spiking, and various uh, issues with asset markets, et cetera, they have somehow held really strong. Now, there have been some interesting trends in what they are spending on, which we'll talk about in a few minutes, but they have really held up. They had a lot of leftover savings from the stimulus programs. Also, job market has been pretty healthy. So those who have switched jobs have managed to eke out a decent nominal wage gain. Now, weirdly enough, if you didn't change jobs, you didn't get too much of a pay hike in this cycle. In fact, most of the pay hike has been for people who switch jobs and, oddly enough, people who are lower skilled because that's where we had a lot of changing, changeover, a lot of great resignation, et cetera, was primarily at the lower end of the skill spectrum. But it's not clear consumers can hold on next year as things get a little bit tighter. So you can kind of see how dramatically retail sales rebounded if you compare that with the 2009 to 2012 period, where it was a slow, drawn-out recovery in spending, this time we got a dramatic improvement in spending. Interestingly enough, early on, a lot of it was when we were stuck at home or in lockdown, well, not so much in Florida. Florida, by September 2020, everything was open. We were back on campus. But in much of the country, people ended up spending on goods. Everybody bought their Peloton bikes, which is probably in the basement right now, or on eBay. Uh, people bought a lot of electronics. Everybody got their webcams now, at least one or two tablets for your kids, extra laptops. We fixed up our houses. We put, a, put in home offices. So that took up some spending. And then, of course, uh, people went out and tried to buy cars. That was an adventure in itself. Now, actually, a lot of spending has shifted to services. Travel, leisure, hospitality is actually what's driving a lot of spending this year. Now, this might interest some of you. So e-commerce sales shot up a lot. So the green line gives you sort of the dollar amount increase in uh, e-commerce sales. But the red line is interesting because that tells you e-commerce sales relative to 
total retail sales. And you can kind of see the dramatic increase in 2020, but since then, it's kind of cooled off. People are starting to go back to stores, do more regular shopping. So at least in terms of share of total sales that's accounted by e-commerce, that's starting to come down a little bit this year. Now, what has sort of really helped our households besides all the stimulus and the strong labor market, and one big difference this time versus 2008, 2009, is going into this pandemic recession, households were in pretty good shape. They didn't have as much debt. They weren't speculating on real estate like last time around. And most households did not have too much debt this time around. And then as the Federal Reserve flooded the economy with a lot of liquidity in 2020 and 2021, stocks recovered dramatically. You can kind of see how quickly stock markets recovered. So, you know, from the bottom in March 2020, we came out of roaring back. By September 2020, we had fully caught up in the stock market. And then we had 2021 was a spectacular year for stock markets. In fact, if you had sold out in Jan 2022, you could have pocketed a really, really nice gain uh, over the past two years. I'm guessing not everybody did that. Uh, now you're along for the ride. Um, now, because financial assets recovered so quickly, also real estate, which is one of the biggest asset holdings for most Americans, recovered so quickly, by end of last year, household net worth, that is total assets minus total liabilities for all American households, as a percentage of their after-tax income, reached an all-time high. By the way, here's something for those of you who are interested in financial history. If you look at the last few times these things shot up, in the 1990s, we got a dot-com bubble, which burst. 2000s, we got a real estate bubble, which burst. Well, what's going to happen this time? So household balance sheets, at least so far on paper, looks good. When you compare asset value of assets most of us have relative to our liabilities, it looks pretty good. And also our debt ratio is not too bad. Although we have seen this year, people finally start taking on more rolling debt, which is credit card debt, is starting to pick up this year. Uh, and also, we are drawing down on the savings many of us had built up in 2020, so savings rates have come down very sharply now. So that cushion is starting to erode for a lot of households. So going forward, you know, a lot is going to depend on what's going to happen to the job market. So far, it's been surprisingly quite strong. It's really held up. So last Friday, we got the latest report. And we still have pretty decent level of job gains. It's really not turning down as dramatically as some people were expecting. So it's still a pretty tight labor market. Now, in fact, what is surprising, there's a several sectors where we haven't gotten back all the employment that we had back in Feb 2022 before the pandemic. So some areas like education, uh, hospitality, we still have some ways to go. And in fact, education, especially K through 12, so many people have quit. There's actually a big shortage of teachers in many parts of the country. And frankly, I don't blame them. It's not exactly an easy job to deal with now because not only do you have to deal with kids who don't want to learn, you also have all these politics and the right, the left, everybody kind of jumping on the teachers. So a lot of them have decided to go do something else. Now, one interesting thing is if you look at wage growth, which is something the Fed is really worried about, it's remaining elevated, but it's kind of interesting in terms of nominal wage growth that is still below inflation. That means in real terms, many of us have actually got a pay cut the last two years or so. So economists, going back to Milton Friedman, have been talking about something called the money illusion. That is, most of us look at our paychecks in dollar amounts. So when you get your direct deposit, 
You just look at the dollar amount by which it's changing. But what most of us are not thinking about is what is that paycheck actually buying? What's happening to your purchasing power? So if inflation is 8.2% and you're getting a 4% increase in wages, you just got a 4.2% pay cut. But most of us don't think that way. So a lot of us, the past two years, weirdly enough, people making over 75K and 100K, we have not seen very big wage increases, not like 8 9%. So in many ways, a lot of us have actually seen real wages go down. And at some point, this is likely to start hitting our spending. Because when you think about grocery shopping and things like that, it is we finally have to pay attention to the grocery bills now because it's actually way more than we are used to paying. Now, one side note, I don't know if any of you have thought about this. So I just wrote this. Uh, it's out in the Hill this morning. So I've been writing for the Hill, which is published in Washington, DC, mostly because I figured, and I'm not getting paid for any of these. I write it for free is because apparently it's one of the main sources of information for congressional staffers. And they pretty much run things because most of our politicians are in their 70s and 80s. So I'm not exactly sure how aware they are of anything. So the staffers tell them what to do. And the hope is if they get better information, they'll make better choices. So I've written about close to 55, 60 pieces over the last two years trying to explain what's going on with the economy. So this one I wrote over the weekend because here's a very interesting puzzle. I don't know if you guys have wondered about this. The three recessions we had before the 2020 pandemic recession were famous for being called jobless recoveries because they created a situation where it took forever for the job market to fully come back and for all the jobs lost from the recession to be fully recovered. You can kind of see clearly those three, uh, the shaded areas are the 1990-91 recession, the 2001 recession, and the Great Recession. And with all three, it took a long time for the labor market to recover. In fact, after the financial crisis, in 2008, it was only 2016 before we fully got back to normal with the labor market. But this time, it came back very quickly. In fact, it is staggering how fast the labor market recovered. And this is not just because the pandemic shock, we shut things down and just reopened it. It's also because how certain very interesting spending and behavioral patterns emerged with this particular recession. That's why I wanted to write this piece, because here's the interesting bit. So the reason the last three times when we got recessions, it took a very long time for jobs to recover was because starting in the late 80s, but in the 90s, 2000s, and the 2010s, whenever you got a recession, companies took the opportunity to get rid of certain types of jobs permanently. So economists at MIT I've come up with this very interesting way of thinking about all jobs. I don't know if you can make this out, but essentially any job we do, you can sort of classify it using whether it is a routine job or a non-routine job, and whether it involves cognitive skills or manual skills. And with those four, you can have a bunch of different combinations for, and classify most jobs within those frameworks. So for example, if you are Let's say doing something uh, like you know, developing computer programming or something like app development, et cetera, that's going to be a cognitive job that's non-routine. It involves a lot of constant tinkering, new thinking, original thinking, and not sort of repetitive type tasks. On the other hand, manufacturing, especially the traditional manufacturing, is routine, manual. It's highly repetitive and it often involves physical activity. So the last three recessions, what happened was they got rid of a lot of those. So typically you get a recession, firms start looking at ways to cut costs, and in many of these sectors, they found that you could either automate those jobs or offshore them. So as a result, a lot of those jobs never came back. And in fact, you can kind of see for the different types of jobs, 
By the way, if you have kids, the ideal thing you should ask them to do is get a job that's non-routine and cognitive. That's the safest. Something that involves thinking, so it's not easily replaceable, and something that's not repetitive, so software cannot automate it, or robots cannot automate it. That's the only thing where you have good job growth in the last 30, 40 years. Everything else is down, but the one that's down a lot is routine manual work. That's largely permanently gone. But here's the weird thing. With the pandemic shock, what happened was guess what we started spending our money on? Oops. Well, initially, when we got the shock and we were stuck at home, we started shopping on Amazon and we started buying a lot of goods. So manufacturing this time held up very well. In fact, manufacturing in places like the auto industry, they couldn't get enough workers. So this time, we didn't really suffer any sort of manufacturing loss. And because we are also dealing with this re reshoring phenomena, where we are trying to reduce exposure to China-based supply chains, we have a continuing demand. You guys have heard of chip uh, investments that Intel is planning near Columbus, and there's a whole bunch of examples like that. So manufacturing and construction recovered very quickly. Everybody decided with remote work and things like that, let's get out of densely populated areas, move to second, third tier cities or suburbs, and everybody suddenly wanted single family, single family units. And so construction really picked up. And interestingly enough, now that we are two years into the recovery, now as we switch over and start spending on travel, hospitality, leisure, et cetera, we have more conferences and all these kinds of things, a lot of the people who got hit early on, the non-routine manual work, that's coming back very quickly. And that's not easily replaceable because it's not easy to automate those kind of jobs and they're not expensive enough to actually automate. So as a result, we had this really interesting phenomena this time where things came back much more quickly than anybody was expecting. Of course, the mistake was the, Fed, the Federal Reserve didn't realize this early enough. So they waited too long because they thought things will be kind of as bad as it was in the previous three recessions. And they were quite freaked out about long-term scarring for the labor market. So in hindsight, they overdid it with the stimulus and easy accommodative policy because the labor market recovered way quicker and didn't need that much support. So now we are sort of facing the consequences because they waited too long. Now, given that we will most likely get a recession next year, the more interesting question right now is, how severe will this be? Now, a lot of us have been thinking it's going to be mostly a milder recession that pulls demand enough to get in line with supply, but there are a few wild cards that could make it a deeper recession. One big one is housing. Now, historically, if you think about it, the things that cause really bad recessions, like the Great Recession or even the Great Depression, it usually involves a big crash involving asset markets and financial institutions. If you don't have those, you typically get a normal recession, which you can get out of pretty quickly. So a lot depends on these two issues. Are we going to get, instead of a mild housing correction, a much more dramatic drop in nationwide home prices. That's one thing to think about. And the other big risk is as we get rates up to levels we have not seen since 2006, so we are essentially at 4% now, and it's probably going to get to 4.5 in 4.5 to 4.75 in December, that's almost guaranteed, because we will get one more rate hike. And then the Fed is talking about getting it above five now. So at those levels, we have to get a little bit more worried because we don't really know what might break. The really tricky thing with a lot of these kind of financial issues, often you only find out later on where the real risk was and where there was excess leverage. In fact, let's be honest, until 07, 08, none of us knew much about things like CDOs or subprime mortgages or 
the various types of things banks were involved with, pretty much all of us kind of found out about it after Lehman Brothers collapsed. So this time as well, something might break. In fact, Warren Buffett uh, has this famous saying, it's the unknown unknowns that really screw you up. Because things you know, you at least have a probability distribution for what might happen. But if you don't even know what probability distribution you have to look at because you don't even know what might go wrong, then we have problems. And that's where I think we have to be a little bit hesitant. So we just got the Federal Reserve's financial stability report and some of the wild cards. So the good news, household balance sheet is much better this time around, going into whatever crisis we get next year. Uh, our biggest banks are in very good shape. So our JP Morgans, our Citi, uh, et cetera, are in Bank of America, are in much better shape this time around. They have plenty of liquidity. Their balance sheets look good. But where we have some concerns, the uh, shadow banks are still very big, and we don't really know what they're up to, how much leverage they have taken on to bet on riskier things like cryptos or something else. Also, one of the things we have to be a little bit worried about is home prices have shot up dramatically nationwide. Now, how much of that is fundamental driven, how much of that is speculative is something to be careful about. Also, the other big fear, there is a lot of debt on the public balance sheet, the government, federal government has a lot of debt. So something might spook the treasury market and if that becomes, it's the world's biggest bond market, and if that does not function properly, that could create a lot of problems. And some non-financial corporations have taken on a lot of debt as well. So those are two areas to watch out for. Now, they did a survey of what are you most freaked out about. A few things have changed since May. I guess we have all kind of gotten used to the Ukraine war now. So that's gone down from 77% to 62%. But way more people are freaked out about China invading Taiwan now. It went from 14 to 42 percent within a few months. Uh, but financial risk, you know, something going wrong is suddenly becoming front and center. People are stuck because rates at these levels, we have essentially a generation that's grown up not knowing high interest rates. And now we are finally there and it might stay there for a while. So we may want to watch out for what might break when rates get about 5%. Now, and we're starting to see some early signs. The, some of the high yield credit has gone up. And you guys might be interested, those of you who might deal with banks. Banks are starting to tighten things up a little bit in terms of loans. So there are some early signs credit is starting to tighten. But the one I wanted to talk a little bit about, because I don't know if you guys are as obsessed about this as people in Florida, but property prices are very, very tricky right now. So we had a dramatic run up, which in some ways was even greater than the 06 housing boom run up. You can kind of see how much the increase was in 2020, 2021. So the summer 2020 to summer 2022 jump was actually bigger than what we got in the 05, 06 jump in home prices. So it's pretty dramatic, but there are some things that are good. Yes, housing affordability, especially in Miami, Tampa, et cetera, has gotten very bad. So if you look at home prices relative to average salary, if you look at home prices relative to rents, so some of those things look quite terrible, especially in places like Austin, Texas, most of Florida, and other parts that enjoyed a boom as folks from the Northeast and California moved here. But one very good thing about this particular cycle is banks did not lower their lending standards. If you look at the credit scores, we don't have the problem that we had last time where we had like ninja loans, no income, no jobs, and they gave you a loan. We don't have those issues. Banks have been very strict about maintaining standards this time around. And also, here's the good news. Most people who locked in their purchases by March or so, locked in 30-year mortgage rates that are 3% or less. So as long as that's the case, your monthly payment's not changing. So you can kind of ride the cycle out. But it is a problem if you're a new buyer. <laughs> you're screwed. <laughs> 
because mortgage rates are over 7%. And here's the other problem. I don't know if you guys have thought about this. Inventories are still very low. So if you thought you know, people might rush to exit and start selling their houses so they can take advantage of high prices, that's not quite happening. Why? Well, here's one way to think about it. If you already locked in your mortgage rate at 3% or less, why would you really go back and test this market where if you sold your house and you try to buy something else, you might have to pay more, and you're going to get a mortgage rate that's around 7%. So if you're already a homeowner, chances are you don't want to put your existing home on the market. Now, here's the other problem we have, which is a much bigger problem. So you can kind of see sales have trickled down pretty sharply. Um, and new single family sales have come down, but it's not likely to lead to a big crash because of a couple of really interesting uh, factors. One, after the last housing bubble uh, burst, for a long time, we never built enough single family units. Instead, what did we build a lot of since 2009? apartment buildings, multifamily units. So that means we don't have enough single family units uh, in terms of inventory. Plus the millennials, poor generation, they keep getting hit with bad news co constantly. They are reaching the peak age where you buy your first house. So the big millennial cohort, which is slightly bigger than the baby boomer cohort, it's 73.6 million or so, compared to about 73 million or 72 and a half for the baby boomers. So the millennials are in their late 30s and early 40s, which is when you, know, you have enough money to put down those down payments, et cetera. So there is some demand there, but if you're running uh, you know, Toll Brothers, D.R. Horton, or one of the big builders, Lennar, et cetera, at this point, you're pulling back on building new houses. Why? even though there might be a lot of demand two, three years from now. Because they are looking at it strategically. If they started a new uh, block of single family houses today, it'll take about eight to 10 months for it to be done and put on the market. But if you think about it, that's when most of us are predicting we'll get a recession. And that's when people will be losing their jobs. If that's the case, why would I want to start new houses right now? So most of them have switched over to building apartments because rent is still high, especially in Florida and I'm guessing in other parts as well. Uh, so there's gonna be some demand for that. And people who couldn't buy their house have to go back to the rental markets anyway. But this creates a problem down the road. We will still not have enough inventory of single family units after the recession is over. So that's why I'm not sure we will likely get a big drop in home prices in the US. But other parts of the world, their things kept going up and up and never really corrected in 08. Places like Canada, New Zealand, Sweden. Uh, I think many of you have heard stories about home prices in Vancouver, Toronto going through the roof. They are correcting dramatically. In fact, some of those are down 20% already because they had an even bigger bubble than we had, and their fundamentals might be more shaky. So other parts of the world might see a dramatic drop in home prices, and frankly, in places like UK, where there is no 30-year mortgage, most people rotate mortgages every three to five years. So you're in serious trouble the next time you go and renegotiate your mortgage. So they might have problems, but for us, I'm still not sure we will get a big crash in housing like we did last time. Much more likely, it sort of gradually cools off the overheated markets, but not a massive crash. But other parts of the financial system, we have to watch out for. And here's one some of you might not even have thought about, which I tried to explain it to my students about what's coming for them in about three, four years time, and that might freak them out. Here's the problem. The US borrowed a lot, but I don't know if you guys know this. So just at the beginning of this year or end of last year, a three month T-bill was barely about 0%. Now we are at close to 
a two-year T note is giving you 4.7% now. But here's the problem. Most of our debt, so we have $31 trillion of debt, so you can see how much debt we have here. But a little bit of that is intragovernmental debt, which is essentially sort of like a magic trick. The Social Security Trust Fund, back when it had a surplus, the Treasury just borrowed against it and gave the trust fund IOUs. Apparently, that's not debt. So the government tends to leave that out and looks at that red line, which is obviously much smaller. But even that, the Treasury debt, if you think about it, a lot of it, instead of locking in when rates were low and issuing 30-year bonds or 20-year bonds, something like half of our debt is in T-bills. So 40 to 50% of our debt is in short-term debt. So when the government rolls it over next year or later this year, instead of paying 0.3%, you're paying 4% for it. So as a result, our interest payment for federal government debt is going to jump something like $280 billion. Because think about it. Let's say approximately you have, uh, say, $24 trillion of outstanding Treasury debt. If you get a 3 4% increase in the borrowing cost, that's 3 to 4% extra on $24 trillion. So you can kind of see how much of the budget will now have to go towards just meeting interest payments. It was easy when it was 0%. You could just keep borrowing and promise people, if you're a Republican, I'll give you tax cuts. If you're a Democrat, I'll just spend more. Everything was free. Now, with rates at 4 added for 5 you have to pay like normal rates. <laughs> but you're paying normal rates on, if you think you have debt, government's got about $25 trillion of outstanding treasury. So that is going to be a big thing to watch out for in terms of what this might do if you have to keep raising rates. So that's sort of a concern for down the road, something that could create problems in the treasury market. Now. The other interesting thing to think about, so we have had inflation levels that we have not seen since 1982. Regardless of how you measure it, CPI, PCE, it doesn't matter, it's at about a 40-year high. Now, one interesting thing as to why we got here, so obviously, you know, politicians want to blame different groups, et cetera, but if you think about it, a lot of things went wrong that led to this massive inflation problem. One, we overdid the stimulus, so total government stimulus of almost $5 trillion in 2020 and 2021 was probably a little too much. That's sort of <laughs> probably an understatement. <laughs> if, you, if you want a comparison, this is the biggest peacetime as a percentage of GDP, the biggest peacetime stimulus in American history. The only other time where we had more spending was World War II. Outside of that, we have not done this much spending. And then the Fed decided it wanted to join the party. So in March, it got rates down to zero. Uh, that was not even half the issue. Instead, they decided, let's create a whole lot of new money. You can see money growth rate reach levels we have essentially never seen. Uh, so money re growth reached over 25% briefly. And part of it was the Fed just created a whole bunch of new reserves and used it, which by the way, they can do it at the New York Fed, where you have an open trading desk, you have a bunch of terminals. The Fed can just go in there, punch in plus $3 trillion, and voila, you have $3 trillion. I wish we could do that. And then they used it to buy treasuries, mortgage-backed securities, et cetera. And you can see the dramatic increase in the size of the Fed's balance sheet. So when the Fed bought all of those things and people sold bonds and mortgage-backed securities, they turned around and used that money to buy stocks, cryptos, and other things. So it created a sort of a wealth effect, which also caused increased spending. So demand was juiced up. And then we got it with a whole bunch of supply shocks. Some workers disappeared, early retirement, some people just quit, 
Uh, we had young, uh, women who left the workforce to look after young kids because childcare became prohibitively expensive. And then we got energy shocks. And then we got global supply chain disruption. So if you combine the juiced up demand with constrained supply, it's no surprise that we got a massive inflation shock. Now, here's the problem. The biggest sort of unknown is what is going to be the inflation and the new reality once we get out of next year's recession? So we kind of know what's coming next. We'll probably get a recession next year almost close to 100%. Unemployment will pick up. We don't quite know how bad it will get. Probably not too bad, but if something goes wrong in the financial system or the housing market, then you're very likely to get a deeper recession. But the biggest unknown in terms of longer term is once we get to 2024, 2025, what is the new normal for inflation? Are we going to go back to very low inflation, very low interest rates, like we had from 09 until 2020? Or have we entered a new reality where things might be more elevated, where interest rates of 3 4% are the more normal, or 4 to 5% is the new normal, and inflation stays three, three and a half, four percent for a persistent period. If any of you are interested, I wrote these piece, this piece a little while, a few months back. The big argument here is all the things that kept a lid on inflation and interest rates for a couple of decades, they're all going in reverse now. Because if you think about it, we had, after Cold War ended, we had this enormous boost to global labor supply. China joined the global system. India liberalized its economy. Eastern Europe, the Iron Curtain fell. So suddenly you had lots of extra labor globally. And companies figured out they could efficiently look for cheap labor anywhere they can find it. You could move capital. You could set up very efficient global supply chains. So you could go to your Best Buy and buy a TV for 200 bucks at Thanksgiving or buy a laptop for 400 bucks. All of that was a reality because of what was happening globally. And then we got some favorable technological shocks as well. But now we are in a cycle where we are deglobalizing. We have geopolitical contests with China, demographics, people, there's aging population in rich countries. Uh, globally, there's a pushback against excess amounts of immigration, migration. So labor supply might not pick up anytime soon. You might not have ready access to cheap labor any, anymore. So the big question is, are we really going to go back to 1.5%, 1% inflation, interest rates that are very low, or are we in a new reality? That is like the $64 trillion question. Because we know what comes next year, but we don't really know what comes after the recession. What is the new reality after this expected recession is over? Do we go back to like what we had from 09 till 2020? Or have we entered a new era? A lot writes on that. And by the way, workers now have bargaining power for the first time since the 1980s. I don't know if you guys know this, private sector unionization rates in the US dropped all the way down to like 7%. So other than, I don't know, firemen, public school teachers, and a few other areas, most of us don't really belong to unions. And so even things like, so for a while, it was, you know, you had technology, international competition, et cetera. So the bargaining power was mostly with capital. Now that might be changing, which might be a good thing in terms of redistribution, but in terms of costs, that's not a good thing. It's gonna raise costs. So that's the big picture. And if any of you are interested in these sort of issues, you can ask Matt. There's a link to all the articles. So if you're curious, take a look at them. They're all freely accessible, by the way, free access. And now, you know, I'm open to questions. Any, any sort of questions you guys have? Yeah, thank you. And we'll, we'll get the uh, PDF of all these slides. will be on the app so you can download it and have access to all that stuff. So um, questions? I mean, I, I, you know, how do I invest the 1.9 billion I'm going to win tonight in the Powerball? Anything like that? 
ENFJ. So if we enter into a higher inflationary cycle, what would be some consequences that would come out of that? I mean, just in general, that stagflation is one thing I've read a little bit about, doesn't sound good. Uh, stagflation is more of a temporary concern. So if you have a situation where output is not growing all that well or you're in a recession and you still have high inflation, that's stagflation, stagnation plus inflation. What I'm talking about is much more about what is the longer term trend for inflation and interest rates for the next 10 years, 12 years. So we have had about two decades where most of us got used to borrowing costs being very low and not worrying too much about inflation outside of college tuition and healthcare and a few other things. Generally, we thought things kind of stayed low or went down in price. But now we might be in an environment where think about if you have much more extreme weather, food inflation might be more persistent and not just a temporary thing. Uh, if you have a situation where certain types of global supply chains have to be reshored or near shored, there are, there's essentially nobody who can get the scale and efficiency of China as the world's biggest factory. So if you try to bring it to Mexico or some other place, it's not going to be as cheap. And also, let's be honest, you know, work ethic is not the same in all parts of the world. So it's not easy to get a lot of people to go work in an iPhone factory for a relatively low amount and be very efficient and productive. So there's a good chance, and by the way, here's the other big concern. Our labor productivity has started to go down this year. It's been negative, which is a huge headache because for each hour of work, if workers are producing less and you're paying them more, we got a problem. Uh, and given the challenges with the learning deficit, the quality of education not being that great. You know, when Gen Z gets into the workforce, watch out. Uh, it's not exactly clear we're gonna have a super efficient scenario where prices go down. So getting back to your question, then we have to reprice things. How much debt can you handle? Where might interest rates have to be to get you positive real returns? So there might be some dramatic uh, reworking of balance sheets because the huge amount of debt people took on since 09 in the corporate sector and in the garment sector was based on the notion borrowing costs will remain low. But if it doesn't, you got a huge problem. Even our federal government is gonna have a huge problem. In fact, if rates stay up, a good social security, Medicare, military, and then the biggest expense is gonna be interest payments in our budget. <laughs> There's not going to be anything else left over. <laughs> well, got time for one more here, Dave. You'll wrap us up. Historically, in the private sector, the, the health of a corporation is the amount of debt they have and how they have to reduce their debt on their balance sheet. Our country has this exorbitant amount of debt. Who, who holds that debt, for one thing? Is it us or is it other countries that hold that debt? And how do we go about getting people to pay off that governmental imbalance? Okay, great. But by the way, uh, you have to be careful about the private debt versus the public debt. So the good news on the private debt side, households, as long as your asset prices stay up, your balance sheet looks good. Of course, if your property crashes and your IRA crashes, then you're back to being poor. Uh, companies, uh, financial institutions, our biggest banks learned their lessons, they're in much better shape. But the non-financial corporations overdid it when rates were low. Some of them took on way too much debt and part of it is our tax system because when you pay interest rates, it's tax deductible. So in fact, you had this weird thing where Apple issued bonds, even though they have like hundreds of billions of dollars of retained cash and use those bond uh, issues to buy back stocks because they could write off the borrowing part. So the tax structure needs to change, getting you know, one of the structural challenges. Now getting back to public debt, so, so roughly about 30% to 35% is held by foreigners, foreign central banks, 
People's Bank of China, Bank of Japan is the biggest single holder. Now, in the past, because the US dollar has been considered the world's reserve currency, foreign central banks have been either willing or been forced to hold our treasury securities. But going forward, there's a push among places like China and obviously Russia and some other countries like Saudi Arabia, et cetera, which tend to have lots of surplus that they have to you know, put somewhere. And in the past, they put it into treasuries. Now they're looking for alternatives because here's the weird thing that happened this year. Because yield went up a lot, the yield is inversely related to price. So that means the price of treasuries have plummeted a lot. So the bond market has suffered a loss of about 30% this year. And it's the first bear market in bonds since about the 1983 or so. So we've had a long period where bonds usually did well. But this year, if you have bond holdings, you're going to suffer a loss of about 30%. So that's making people a little bit hesitant about lending money to, and also this is another thing you have to be aware of, if the yield is still below inflation, you're not really making a real return. So why are you lending to the government and losing money? So all these things might make it more expensive when we roll over the debt in the future. By the way, weirdly, if we run inflation pretty high, that re reduces our debt burden. Because what ends up happening is you look at debt as a percentage of GDP, dollar GDP, nominal GDP. So typically, essentially, if inflation is high, the government is paying back the bondholders with dollars that are worth less. So it's like an inflation tax, essentially. And by the way, when inflation is high, your capital gains tax is not adjusted. So you'll pay a bigger tax bill. Part of the income tax, the brackets will change next year, but you'll still get more tax revenue from you know, having higher pay in nominal terms. So the government, one easy way to reduce the debt burden is to run inflation pretty hot for a while. All right. Well, there's a lot to digest there. It's, it's clear as mud as to where we're going to be, and uh, I'm sure t tomorrow won't have anything to do with it. Uh, we'll see, right? Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Really thank appreciate you. it. Thank you. So we're, we're going to break for 20 minutes. There's uh, a little bit of dessert out there for those of you with a sweet.